Let's consider the issue of managing subjective scale consistency within our survey. So here's a common issue that happens after we design all the questionnaire items for our survey. Uh, once they're all finished, we realize that we have selected a variety of different scale label types, which means that the participant in our survey would be hopping from one type to another in between questions. However, rapidly transitioning between different subjective scale types can increase respondent fatigue, frustration, and comprehension. We do not want this to happen during our survey. So what do we do? Let's see an example of what I mean by this. Take a look at these three survey questions that are all reasonable and could belong in a survey. They're all related to craft beer. The first one is a Likert five point scale, asking people how much they agree with the following statement. Any beer that can get me drunk is a pretty good beer. The next one is a five point important scale. How important is it for you to have a craft beer be extremely hoppy? And finally, the bottom one is a preference scale. What level of preference, if any, do you have for locally produced craft beers compared to craft beers made elsewhere? Important scales, preference scales, and liquor scales are extremely common in marketing research. But yet, if we put these all together in sequence on a survey, it's going to confuse the respondent. Not only do they have to comprehend each question, they have to re-comprehend what each one of the subjective scales means. So what are some potential solutions we can consider? Most typically, we just reword the questions so that one single subjective scale type is now appropriate for all three of the questions. Another option might be we simply regroup and reorganize our entire questionnaire so that all of the subjective scale styles are merged together in a single place. Finally, keep in mind that I'm not saying here that we can never switch up our subjective scales. Maybe it's appropriate to have a Likert scale in one part of our survey and an important scale in another, but we should be cautious about overdoing it. Here's an example of a basic solution. We're asking the same three questions, but now we're asking them in such a way that a Likert scale is appropriate for all three. An issue we also regularly deal with is we have to determine how many scale points we want to have in our subjective scales. Even once you've selected a particular scale to use, how do you know if it should be a two point scale, three point scale, five point, seven point, or something more? Again, let's consider one of the questions we had from the craft beer survey previously. It appears as though we have settled on using a Likert scale, a Likert style scale, so it's agreement scale. The difference here is there are three different versions. One is a three point scale, one is a five point scale, and the other is a seven point scale. Which one is the right one to use for our questionnaire? This is one of those it depends sort of answers. So rather than saying there's definitively a correct choice here amongst these three options, we should consider various important issues. First, Fewer scale points generally make it easier for respondents to answer our questions. They have less to consider, but it does, of course, result in less precision with our results. If we use a three point scale here, we only know that people will agree, but we wouldn't have the ability to detect whether they only slightly agreed or strongly agreed. Also keep in mind that the leftmost and rightmost scale labels have the greatest impact on how people process and understand our scale. These far anchor points truly dictate how intense our scales are when we choose them, so we need to choose those carefully. Finally, it should be noted that most applied marketing research practices today tend to favor the use of five or seven point scales. Most academic literature generally supports this application as well. However, we now live in a world where many people are taking surveys using mobile devices. Smaller screen naturally means that longer scales, seven points or more or five or more, are harder to see on the small screen. It very well may be true that fewer scale points are a more defensible option in today's data collection environment. Finally, we should keep in mind how we plan on analyzing this data. If our intention analyzing these results was merely to aggregate all of the agreement and all of the disagreement answers into bins anyways, well that would motivate us to simply use fewer points originally since we had no intention of analyzing the data in a more precise manner. Let's take a look at some different response scaling strategies and see how we can anticipate how they will affect respondent behavior when engaging with our questionnaire. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the results from the exact same questionnaire item but asked to two different groups of respondents. In other words, we did a simple A-B experiment. Half of them saw the exact same question presented with one scale. 
and the other half saw a different scale. We will report those results by simply showing the response categories on the x-axis and the percentage of respondents on the y-axis. And by looking at these, we will figure out how scale design choice affects how people respond to scales. We'll try to understand why that might be. And among the two options shown on each of the following slides, we'll try to figure out which one is generally a best practice. So the running question that we're going to work with here is we're going to imagine that we surveyed some consumers and we asked them the following question. Overall, how satisfied are you with your most recent Airbnb stay? And here's sort of our default chart. Notice I don't have a precise number on the y-axis. That's because I'm merely illustrating the relative levels of these answers. But we would imagine that if we added up all of these bars together, they would add up to 100%. In other words, all of the responses. Now let's look at these two scenarios. In the scenario above, we only had two labels on the far left and the far right. We merely had very unsatisfied and very satisfied. Whereas on the bottom option, we had all of our label points labeled with terms. Look at the pattern of responses between these two sets of results. What's different? For the bars above, notice how the very unsatisfied and the very satisfied groups both have a higher percentage of responses than we saw in the one in five scoring option on the bottom. Also notice that the middle score, the three, has a slightly higher percentage of respondents in the blue bars above. What's going on here? Well, what's going on is similar to the same conversation we've already had about interval level data. We've learned that the labels that we ascribe to numerical values is where people understand the meaning of a particular numerical score. In the option above, we didn't provide people with specific interpretations of the two, three, and four, and they're merely left to their own devices to interpret what those numbers precisely mean to them. Absent clear explanations of what we intend them to mean, people are much less likely to select those options. Hence, the answers get biased towards the one and the five, or in the cases where people are knowing that very unsatisfied and very satisfied are not appropriate, they bunch their answers towards the middle. The takeaway here is that labeling all of the points on a subjective intensity scale is good practice. Another question we sometimes contend with is whether or not we should have an even number or odd number of scale points. We have the same setup that we had below, but this time above, we have a different setup where all the options are labeled, but we only we have an even number of scale points, one to six. What are the differences in results between the top and bottom options? The difference in results is mostly in the interpretation. If we take the results above literally, everybody is either unsatisfied to some degree or satisfied to some degree. Whereas in the option at the bottom, people are somewhat neutral or ambivalent in their answers. They're neither satisfied nor unsatisfied there. It's important to keep in mind that people do not like being forced to have a preference or opinion about a topic when they really don't have one. Therefore, the use of even numbered scales is generally considered inappropriate for marketing research. We almost always use odd numbered scales when we measure intensity. What about when we add a great deal of additional number of scale labels and points on our scale? So in the option above here, we now have a nine point satisfaction scale relative to our five point scale. The intuition of many people is when you have more points on a scale, the results themselves become more precise. But that's rarely so. Rather, we get the same basic results for purposes of interpretation as marketing researchers. We're now just putting bigger cognitive burdens on our respondents as they're trying to decipher what each one of the points means. There's not too many applied marketing situations where we would draw a major distinction between, say, slightly satisfied and mostly satisfied, or mostly unsatisfied and slightly unsatisfied. And since we rarely would draw meaningful interpretations from that distinction, we shouldn't burden respondents by asking for such a precise answer. So keep in mind that we generally want to use no more than seven scale points on a subjective intensity scale. In this example, the scales are exactly the same in terms of their labeling. The difference is the numerical values. The top option has a negative two to positive two scoring, and the option on the bottom has a one to five scoring. What's the impact of shifting the scoring mechanism on how people respond? The answer is there really is none. The response pattern is the same. As we've discussed previously, it's the response labels themselves that people draw meaning from on interval level scales. Therefore, the, the underlying scoring mechanism is irrelevant from the perspective of how survey respondents will interact with the question. 
Perhaps one of the most important questions that is poorly considered by people new at designing questionnaires is whether or not we should include an I don't know, NA, or similar style option to the far right of the scale. Keep in mind, if we don't give people an I don't know option, that means we're compelling them to offer an opinion that they may not really have. If you look at the results at the bottom here, it would appear as though there's a decent number of individuals who are neither satisfied nor unsatisfied. But if we look at what happens when we include an I don't know or NA style option, we realize that many of those people who selected three actually meant they have no opinion or they don't know. And let's keep in mind, being neither satisfied nor unsatisfied and literally not knowing the answer to a question are two entirely different things. The assumption sometimes made by new marketing researchers is that answers in the middle are all neutral and they can be treated as such, but that's not so. Let me illustrate with a more concrete example. Let's imagine that we did a survey of individuals who own Mac laptops. We asked the question, overall, how satisfied are you with the Apple Touch Bar? It's a colorized touchscreen that run, runs along the top of the bar. Imagine in some situations we didn't have an I don't know option. In another situation, we did have an I don't know option. Now these are strictly hypothetical results, but what's the difference here? Notice with the IDK option, we have a large percentage of respondents who say they don't know. This is indicative of the fact that in many cases, they may literally not have had an Apple Touch Bar, so they don't have an opinion, or they don't use the feature enough to have a meaningful opinion. If we didn't provide an I don't know option, the most typical response we would expect those people to do instead is to say that they are neither satisfied nor unsatisfied. From a marketing perspective, the interpretation of these two sets of results are entirely different. On the top option, we literally know that half the people don't have an opinion. That's very meaningful when it comes to thinking about how we want to influence and persuade or share knowledge to our consumers about the potential use of the Apple Touch Bar. One of the downsides of including an I don't know or no opinion or NA option along with a scale is we don't know what the heck we're supposed to do with those options typically. To figure out what you should do with those answers that people give to I don't know, you have to go back to your original research question and think carefully about how you intend to use the results. Let's consider one scenario. Let's, have, let's imagine that I wanted to know the total percent of all people who really love my brand. Now, if that was the case, I would treat I don't know or no opinion answers as valid scores. If they don't know about my brand, well, then they can't love it. And if my goal was to know the total percent of all people who really love my brand, clearly them not knowing is part of the denominator when I'm calculating the percent of who really love my brand. On the other hand, let's imagine that I wanted to know the average satisfaction score among consumers who experience a stay at my hotel. Now let's also imagine I know for a fact that the people taking my survey are people who did in fact stay at the hotel. When I include a no opinion or I don't know option here, and they provide such an answer, I would probably exclude those responses from my analysis. When someone says I don't know to this satisfaction question, I don't wanna presume that they aren't satisfied or that they are satisfied. Instead, they merely said they don't know. So it is likely my strategy here would be I would remove those respondents from the analysis, hopefully it's a small percentage of all my responses, and instead just analyze those people who offered an opinion about their level of satisfaction. In this simple example between these two options, I don't mean to trivialize how important it is to think carefully about what to do with the I don't know or NA options, but keep in mind the answer always lies in understanding how you intend to present the results and what purpose they serve. Sometimes when you select a response scale for a marketing questionnaire, you break some of the typical rules. It's okay to break the rules if you have a clear, good reason for doing so. For example, sometimes we don't follow the best practices because we're trying to maintain consistency with previous practice and we want to compare the results of our survey longitudinally over time. For example, we should know by now that the net promoter score is actually a zero to 10 point scale question. However, if in the past our company incorrectly asked this question on a five point scale, we might be tempted to maintain this incorrect approach so that we can more easily track over time how our net promoter score has performed. Sometimes we select our scale based on its ability to match up perfectly with some secondary data or secondary research that we want to compare our results to. For example, if a secondary research project used a three point agreement scale, which is not typical practice. However, we want to compare the results of our company 
to all adults in that research project, we may be inclined to use a three-point agreement scale as well. Finally, as mentioned previously, we have to keep in mind how people are actually going to be taking this questionnaire. The use of smartphones remains a wonderful example of how people interact with questionnaires is radically different from the days of paper and pencil or large desktop screens. So best practices evolve given the mode that people interact.